Good morning, everyone. Um, Good morning. Uh, welcome to our uh, weekly Sunday school lesson. We're going to be continuing um, on our chapter about repentance, chapter 15 of the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Repentance unto Life and Salvation. Um, so by way of recap, last week, uh, Pastor Phil took us to paragraphs one and two, which I'll briefly read. Um, Such of the elect that are converted at riper years, having sometime lived in the state of nature and therein served diverse pleasures, God in their effectual calling gives them repentance to life. That was uh, paragraph one, not uh, paragraph two. Whereas there is none that does good and none that does not sin, and the best of men may, through the power and deceitfulness of their corruption dwelling within them, the prevalency of temptation fall into great sins and provocations God has in the covenant of grace mercifully provided that believers so sinning and falling be renewed through repentance unto salvation. Well, again, last week, Phil gave us uh, an overview of repentance, right? Some of the things that we uh, went over was the fact that repentance is something that God gives, right? It's something that God grants. It is grace. Um, also that with repentance is faith, right? We realize that that is, um, though there are distinction between repentance and faith, they're inseparable, such as two sides of the same coin are, are, are ultimately inseparable. They go hand in hand. Um, many times in the scriptures, we often see repent and believe together, though not always. Um, yet even still, repent and belief, right? Faith are, 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 inexorably tied. Um, we went through some watershed texts, you know, such as the parable of the vineyard uh, workers who, though were hired at different hours of the day, all received the same wage, indicative of, of God's grace that extends to all. Uh, it's not about works. It's not about what we've done, um, but about God's grace and such as repentance that he gives to uh, sinners. Um, but uh, just want to go over uh, what is repentance? What do we recall from last week's lesson about repentance? When you repent of your sins. Mm. Yeah, like turning, turning from your sins. Yeah. Turn your face away from sinners. Sin. Yeah. Absolutely right. And, and those are some of the ways that we think about it, and they're not entirely off, right? Oftentimes when we think of repentance, as you said, Maria, we think about it as it's turning away from sin, right, and forsaking of one's sin. Uh, and while turning away from sin is certainly uh, part and parcel with repentance, it's not exactly what the word repentance means, right? Uh, nor what it means to repent, right? Um, is anyone here without looking below and besides Greg or Pastor Phil or Pastor Pete can define what repentance is, right? That, that Greek word metanoia. So, so it can literally mean afterthought or to think differently afterwards, right? And it also denotes a change in one's mind or purpose that then results in the work, that then results in the turning away, right? So it's a, it's a change of, of, of mind um, that results in a change of action, right? And the nature of this mind change is two-pronged, right? And what do I mean by that? Well, on the one hand, uh, it is a change of mind concerning sin, right? Both broadly speaking and in particular. Uh, for instance, when God effectually calls uh, a sinner from death to life through the enabling power of the Holy Spirit, um, i.e. regeneration, one of the first things that person will usually begin to realize is that their whole lives thereunto, right, up until that point, um, they'd lived in complete and utter rebellion and rejection of God's law, of God's righteousness, uh, and, and that they were in outright rebellion to him, right? And though there may be one or two sins at the forefront of their mind, right, perhaps something that they were previously engrossed in, right, or something that they were immediately saved out of, oftentimes the person will immediately, if not eventually, come to the realization of their sinful state. They'll become aware, of, I, I've, I've been in this sinful state my entire life, right? Um, as well as the myriad of other ways in which that manifests itself, right? Uh, the thief may soon discover that as a catalyst to his thievery lay within him a covetous heart, right? The same as with an adulterer or a murderer. I, I want that, I'm gonna take that, even though it's not mine to take, right? The one who dishonored his parents, whether directly or indirectly, may soon realize that the pride of his, in the pride of his heart, he set up a graven image, right? An idol of self, which he bows down to and worships, right? With little regard for any but himself, not his parents, not anyone, right? And that's pride, right? Like Isaiah, upon beholding the holiness of God in, in his temple, right? Or like the apostle Paul arriving at the end of himself in Romans seven, right? Um, so too does the sinner upon having their eyes open to the truth of the gospel, the truth of their sinfulness, right? Do they then realize that they are men of 
unclean lips amidst the people of unclean lips, wretches amidst a wretched generation, right? We, we're all sinners in a world of sinners, right? And that's something that God reveals to us, uh, right? Unless you think that the transgressions themselves uh, encapsulate the whole of the judgment, we can consider again what Jesus says in John, 13, 9, uh, uh, John 3, 19, rather, uh, also looking at 16, 8 through 9, and John 8, 24. John 3, 19, and this is the judgment. That light has come into the world and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. 16, 8 through 9. And when he comes, this is the Holy Spirit Jesus is talking about, the helper. He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. John 8, 24. I told you that you would die in your sins for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in, in your sins. Right? The condemnation of our sin will be on account of our in unbelief, right? The disposition which all men are, are born into naturally, right? We were all born into in a hostile state against God, incapable of belief, but for the intervention of God, right? And if not for that grace, we would have remained there. Uh, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, which Paul exclaims, right? Why? Because he atones for our sin, right? And because he will deliver us from this body of death. And therein lies the second prong of this mind change, right? When we're thinking about repentance and a mind change, um, the second prong is how we think about Jesus, who he is, and what he's done. So the first prong was how we think about sin, right? Our, ourselves and our sin before God. Secondly, how we think about Jesus, who he is, what he's done for us, what he's done to remedy our sin, right? And a passage of scripture, which I think highlights this particularly well, can be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, if anyone would care to read that, uh, sorry, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 17. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Amen. So we see the love of Christ, which, which Paul is saying compels us, right? Controls us. And also the work of Christ, right? In that his death was not without purpose. What, what is his death accomplished? He died for all, right? Not everyone that has ever lived, of course, but all types of people and certainly all of the elect, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake um, died and was raised, right? We, we, we think about Jesus differently, right? We don't just regard him as a good teacher, as a, a figure of history, uh, but rather as the God of history, right? Uh, it's all his story. And, and we, we praise him and we worship him for that. Moving on to our paragraph for today, um, paragraph four, uh, I know that might take you off. We, we did paragraph one and two. You think we'd be up to three, but we're, we're doing four. Um, for reasons, but it all fits still within the, within the overall flow. Um, but, uh, I'm going to read that for us. Sorry, I just lost my thing here. As repentance is to be continued through the whole course of our lives upon the account of the body of death, uh, and the motions thereof, so it is every man's duty to repent of his particular known sins particularly. All right. So as I focus today, and it seems rather clear, right, according to what I just read and what's been outlined above, that it is the duty of the Christian to be in a state of continual repentance, right? Uh, not a one-shot thing, but a continual, continual. life of repentance. Uh, and furthermore, that said repentance is to be carried out with specificity, right? Or to use their terminology, particularity, right? Um, but why is that? And we have some crucial questions that we will hopefully answer uh, the first of which being why are believers to be in a continual state of repentance throughout the duration of their lives? Some might posit, you know, we repent unto salvation. Would that not be enough? Of course, this is a wrong view, but this is something that some people think. So we want to answer why is it that believers to be in continual state of repentance throughout our lives, right? Why it's not just a one-time thing. Um, believe in Christ once, we're saved, we're covered for all. Like, why do we continue to repent? Second question is, why is, the believe, why is it the believer's duty to repent of their known sins particularly, right? Um, so over the next half hour or so, we'll endeavor to answer these crucial questions uh, and perhaps discover what they reveal to us on the one hand about the corruptive nature of sin 
and on the other about the steadfast love and the amazing grace of God. So let's get into it, looking at section one. I, I've broken down our paragraph into two sections, uh, the first of which I'll read, as repentance is to be continued through the whole course of our lives upon the account of the body of death and the motions thereof. So again, we're looking at that crucial question number one, why are believers to be in a continual state uh, of repentance while they live? Uh, we, we sin. We may sin. Yes, pretty much to put it plainly, yeah. right? Uh, we read, uh, we just read that it is, quote, to be continued throughout the whole course of life, end quote. But why? Well, we a little further ahead, immediately further ahead, right? And we arrive at the answer to our question, upon the account of the body of death and the motions thereof. Right, we can even rephrase that last part a bit for some clarity so as to read because of the body of death and its manifestations, right? All of the ways in which the body of death manifests itself in our lives, right? So the believer is to remain in a continual state of repentance because of the body of death and all the ways in which it manifests itself, right? In short, it's why we continually repent, right? Because the body of sin or body of death uh, is continually manifesting itself. Therefore, we continually repent. Just as you said, Maria. Um, but now another question is raised, and perhaps even two. What is the body of death, right? And secondly, what are its motions? That is, how is it manifest in believer's life, or what is its MO, what is its modus operandi? Uh, now technically, there's only one verse in scripture which, uh, in which we see the exact language, body of death, that exact uh, phrase being used. Uh, and that is Romans chapter seven, verse 24. We do, however, see it's like one chapter earlier, in Romans 6, wherein we read, Romans 6, 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Right? So body of death, body of sin. Body of sin here refers to the rule of sin, right? The rule of, the, the rule of sin itself, yet without excluding the involvement of the personal self that lives through the body. Right. So in other words, not only is the body of sin, the reality of, of sin, the principle of, of the domineering pervasiveness of sin in our lives. Right. But it's also the personal manifestation of it uh, expressed through our very bodies. Right. Expressed through Michael, expressed through Paul, how it comes out in each of us. Um, and, and it's your proclivities to evil as well as my own. Right. And, and they may differ to varying degrees and they reveal themselves in a range of uh, different uh, categories. Right. Different types of sins. Uh, nevertheless, the principle holds true that before and apart from the intervention of Christ, all men are slaves to sin. Uh, and James tells us to paraphrase it. Sin is that infant conceived of evil desire, which fully grown brings forth death. It's James 115. Right. And the only abortion a believer should ever be on board with is that of their own sin. Right. If, 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 if sin is that infant, yeah. we're looking to kill it, you know. Um, it, it, death is its wages, right? Romans 6.23, on account of it, men are flying to hell this very moment. Uh, God said through his prophet Ezekiel, the soul that sin shall die. He said it twice in the same chapter in verse 4 and 20 of Ezekiel 18. Be killing sin or be killing you. Not scripture, but uh, sage advice from a Puritan John Owen. Be killing sin or it will be killing you. Um but going back to Romans 7, 24, uh, there the Apostle Paul exclaims rhetorically, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Right. Um, in the context of that verse, being the uh, being our own struggles with sin, his his own struggles with sin uh, and thus extrapolated further. Right. The conflict present within every believer. And this is the conflict of the two natures at war within us. Right. With the, 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 the nature of the spirit. Right. The spirit. And the flesh. Um, and now maybe prudent to note, um, and many of you may be aware of this, uh, but there are and have been historically two different interpretations of this passage in Romans uh, concerning who, who exactly this man is that Paul is referring to. Um, when he's saying I, the question has been, was he describing uh, an unregenerate man merely trying to keep his salvation or uh, of a regenerate believer? Um, despite being fully regenerated, finding themselves continually beset by sin. This has been a question that's been debated throughout the ages. There, there, are, there are genuine arguments um, to both sides, although personally I hold to the latter. I believe most of us here, Grace, do as well, right, that Paul is referring to the conflict within a believer. Um, and, and of this conflict, the Lord himself made his disciples privy, right? And he did this both by way of encouragement and also by way of warning. You may recall the scene from Matthew 26, 
Jesus, immediately before his betrayal and arrest, goes to Gethsemane to pray. He's taking his disciples with him. He's about to fulfill the very purpose for which he came to this world and was born, right? And that was to die for his people. Um, in so doing, he would have to drink the cup of God's wrath. And naturally, he was very much troubled by this. And we know that because scripture records his very words from that hour. In verse 38, again of Matthew 26, he says, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. He instructs the majority of them to wait in one spot. And then he goes on to another spot a little further, taking Peter, James, and John. Right. Uh, and there we read, continuing from verse 39, uh, and going on a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you do not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, was Peter unsaved? Of course not. He, 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 he Jesus to die. Yeah. No, yeah. No, but I'm asking, was Peter unsaved, right? Jesus is kind of offering a, 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 a slight rebuke and exhortation to him. And, and I'm trying to bring it back to that, that, that point of the debate in Romans 7, whether Paul is talking about an unsaved man or a saved man. But of course, Peter was saved, right? Sure, he can be a bit brash, uh, immature perhaps, and at times weak in the faith, but he was a believer, no less, right? Just 10 chapters earlier in Matthew 16, we see Jesus commending Peter for his confession. Right. And he remarks that this knowledge, the knowledge that Peter just confessed about Jesus was not attained by mere human deduction, but by divine revelation. Right. Can someone read Matthew 16, 15 to 17? He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my my Father who is in heaven. Amen. In John chapter 6, um, after many of his disciples, quote unquote, excluding the 12, end up leaving him on account of some harsh sayings. What are those harsh sayings? I.e. that one must eat of my flesh and drink of my blood uh, to abide with me, to have eternal life. Uh, he asked them, he asked them too, right? And these are now the 12, uh, if they intend on parting ways. Peter, the spokesman of the group, responds, John 6, 68 and 69, Simon Peter answered to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Right? So it's clear that, that Peter's convictions are, 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 are sincere and also God-given. Right? And yet we know this same Peter, arguably one of Jesus' closest disciples, would end up denying him three times. We know he'd end up ultimately being restored, and even repenting those three times, but denied him three times in a single night, right? So, so when, it's, when it says the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak, is that is that the Holy Spirit or is, that, is it the human spirit? The Holy Spirit. The Holy, yeah, there's the a debate on, on, on whether it's, it's really the human, whether it's the, it's the person or, or it's the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I, I, I believe it's more towards the, 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 the Holy Spirit, right? Especially when you're talking about that I mean, that Peter conflict. Was definitely saved. He, de he definitely had the spirit at yeah. that point, because obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if he denied Jesus three times, he was saved. He was saved. Yeah. And the point that I'm trying to make is that the battle between the flesh and, and the spirit is something that believers, even believers, face, and it can be very real. It can be very shocking, even in some of the things that you know we might be let to do you know, on account of sin and be kind of, kind of the flesh, right? Um, but to, yeah, to answer your question, I, I believe it was the Holy Spirit because I mean, even if it was the sp his human spirit, right? And if it was that alone without the Holy Spirit, would that really even, like, would that even be able to contend with, with, uh, with the flesh? Like, it would just be going along with the flesh, right? Humans do things of, of, out of their spirit of evil, like, you know, so... That's why I personally think. When we went through sanctification, we talked about the battle, the, the constant striving between the flesh and, and the new nature. And it comes up here again that we have to repent every time we sin because it's a constant battle. Yeah. And every time we fall into sin, we have to acknowledge that we sin and repent. Exactly. It's a constant battle. Exactly. And, and that, that, again, brings us back to like our paragraph talking about the continual 
sort of nature and reality of this repentance, right? It's not a, a one-time thing because we don't sin one time, um, right? And all this to show that sin is ever present, right? Even within the believer, it's, it, it's lying in wait, right? Crouching at the door uh, and its desire is against us, right? That's what God told Cain. In Christ, no longer are we slaves to it, but beset by it, and often so, we most certainly are, right? And, and so we are to be watchful, sober-minded, vigilant, and also prayerful, right? Seeking the Lord for strength and renewal in those moments, right? Because if we think we can try to do anything, whether, whether it's prayer or whether it's to be able to be bold and stand for Christ, if, if, we're, not, if we're not aware of the, of the attacks of the devil, of the, of the weakness of our flesh, and if we're not seeking that, that fount of grace for power and strength, don't think we fare any better than Peter or, or anyone that's fallen, right? Because sin is something we face daily and which remains in us, uh, though not in a place of utter dominion as it once was, we must and will daily be repenting of it, seeking the Lord for grace to change uh, our hearts and our minds concerning it and all the more concerning him, concerning Christ. Um, he is holy and so he calls us to be holy just as he is, right? And listen, we, we won't achieve perfection in this life. I, I'm pretty sure we all know that here, Right, at least certainly not in terms of practical holiness, uh, unless of course Christ comes before we leave the earth, right? And we see Him as He is, uh, and we will be like Him because uh, we will see Him as He is. But um, uh, however, there is a reality of again, and this is tying back into sanctification. It's early chapter, but it's it kind of all relates. However, there is a reality, right, of a progressive growth in holiness, right? A, a progressive growth in sanctification, which leads to greater maturity, increased conformity to. To, to the moral law of God, uh, both in thought and deed, right? And, and Paul attests to these things adamantly. I'll read Philippians 3, 12 to 21. Uh, not that I've already obtained this or that I'm already a perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Only let us also hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory is in their shame with their minds set on earthly things. But our, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we would wait a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, and by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Right, so if you just take note of the, the emphasis that I've added in those verses on things having to do with thought and the mind, remember repentance is a change at its root, is a change of mind, which inevitably leads to a, a, a change in action and transformation. It's a gift of God, right? Um, uh, and the greatest act of transformation will come when our Lord and Savior Jesus returns, right? Y yet knowing this ought not leave us uh, in a place of complacency, right? With with little regard to holiness, but rather all the more serious about our growth in it, right? Because we can, you can, we can just think, well, the Lord's gonna just come back, and then everything will be good. Why am I striving? Why am I continuing to repent? I know I'm saved. I'm gonna, the, the Lord's gonna come, and it's gonna be all things gonna be well. That's a, that's a f extremely flawed way of thinking, right? Um, consider the Apostle John's encouragement to us in First uh, John three, one to three. If someone would read that, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who does hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Right. So even as we hope in him, yet we're still aiming to purify ourselves, not not in the sense of justification that that purification, but the, the sanctification that we are enabled to even take part in uh, now that we are in Christ. Right. We continue to want to grow in holiness. Uh, we repent and, and continually so because as God's children, we love our father. Right. We love his holiness. We love his purity, right? None of which, by the way, uh, he compromised in order to grant us sonship, right? Uh, though it did cost him dearly, right? His dearly beloved and only begotten son, the only one in whom he was well-pleased, yet we know he was even well-pleased to crush him, 
right? He graciously stayed Abraham's hand in Genesis 22 from, from, from slaying his son Isaac, but he refused to stay his own hand at Calvary, right? He, had he done so, it'd be game over for us. But remember, it was our sin that necessitated Calvary, right? And so as often as we transgress his commands, which, which ought never to be burdensome, right? But because of indwelling sin may sometimes seem so, uh, and as often as we commit those atrocities for which our Savior bled and died, we must confess them to God, right? We must confess them to God and we must appeal to his faithfulness, right? And also to his justice and trust that we will find forgiveness and cleansing, right? In 1 John 1, 9, he's both faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse from all unrighteousness. We confess um, our sins to him. Uh, so we must plead for uh, God to change our minds, right? To change our minds and not, and not just in an intellectual sense, our mind encompassing our, our, our emotions, our affection, our, our will, all of that, right, about them. What is them? About sin and about Christ, right? To turn in faith towards him uh, and taking the appropriate steps to ensure that said atrocities are no longer our practice. Again, it doesn't mean that we're going to be sinless in this life, but we're not making sin our practice. If there were sins in which we were, were steeped or engrossed or things that we did without even care or notice and God has revealed this to us and we confess it to him, we are, 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 are to confess, to turn away, and, and in turning away, putting those things away from us. It is no longer our practice. Um, you know, it's our practice to brush our teeth. It's our practice to put on our clothes. It's our practice to go to work. Sin should no longer be our practice. It'll be something that's with us in this life, but it's not something that we, we do heartily as a job. It's something we despise, we hate. Um, so... Looking at Ephesians 4, uh, 17 to 24, really quick, I'll read. Now this I say, and I testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, right? There, there's a, there's a, there's an urging. Uh, in the futility of their minds, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy practice of every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, uh, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, sorry, and um, uh, former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, put on the new self and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness, right? So there's... Uh, in repentance, our minds must be renewed, right? And, and, and renewed concerning sin and concerning God. And I've repeated this a million times, but I'm really trying to get us to get it. Um, because it's God who's graciously supplied the, the, the atonement for it, the, in the basis by which we can turn, right? Romans 2, 4. Do you presume, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance, right? Even the kindness of God, the fact that he put up with us for, for many of us, for such a long period of time before he even saved us. That alone like, should have been something that at, at salvation would be like, Lord, thank you for not sending me to hell all the times that you rightfully could have. You know, Thank you for bearing with me all of these years, even though many times I, was, I still remain stubborn in this area, in this area, in this area. You know, um, It's meant to lead us to repentance. Romans 12, 1 to 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. Um, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 3a. Finally then, brothers, this is concerning the will of God. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that you received from us uh that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and please God just as you are doing, that uh, you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. And he goes on to it in specificity with regard to sexual morality, but the principle remains the same. The will of God is our sanctification, whether from sexual impurity or, or any other sin. Um, and, and so I believe we answered that first question quite thoroughly, but let's let's test it, shall we? Why are believers, and I'm posing this as a question to you, to remain in a continual state of repentance throughout the course of their lives? You still have sin. And we need to wrestle with that. Like while we're still in the flesh, um, 
because we're not perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Like, can can we say that when you repent, um, although it's the same in essence, it's it's slightly different in purpose or reason in the sense of when you repent of your sin, it's because you've been regenerated and you first come to know Christ. Now that you are a believer, as it says in John 13, that you, we need our feet washed. Um, we, we read that passage, I believe. Last week. Uh, we need our feet washed because we still walk on the on the road of, uh, in, in this world in, in, in the sense that we're not of the world, but we're in the world. Yeah. Um, and so when we repent, we repent of, of known sin that we know displeases God, but it does not give us salvation. Um, it's something that we do out of our love for our Lord. I, I've, I've displeased you. I've, I've, uh, I've messed with an idol or, or my, my lusts. Of, of greed or money or whatever it may be and and because I've displeased you will you forgive me I want to keep short accounts with you yeah absolutely I, w- I would agree 100% and I think that I recall from what I listened to your, to your lesson last week that was one of the questions that you had asked right is repentance something that only a believer can do right yes and, and, and it's not in the same it's, it's not a, it's not a repent at least the repentance that we're talking about here is not that one that would merit salvation or that would get you into God's good graces, such as Roman Catholics believe with penance, right? Um, but it, but it's, it stems from a desire to remedy a displeasure that, that may exist between us and God on account of a si- a sinful, sinful actions, right? Um, in, in, in something we want to set right. Uh, the believer is to remain in a continual state of repentance throughout the course of their lives because they're born again, they continue to wrestle with sin, right? As you said, Paul, in the flesh, i.e. the body of death or, or sin, uh, and also because we love the Lord, right? Uh, and we, we, we aim to please him by faithfully living in his will. Uh, right, right. He's, a, he's our father. And, and, and it's, it's not a, re- not a repentance to be saved, but a, a repentance from the sin that we continually have in our lives. It's an original repentance before we are saved. That's like seeing what sin is that, mm. that we, we actually did was sin against God mm-hmm. every everything all the sins that we committed mm-hmm. and then we turn to God and for salvation and faith continuing repentance is repenting of particular sins yes that we do that we commit all the time because we're still sinners right 100%. it's not the same as the beginning not the same as the beginning first see that sin is sin right then we see what's individual sin right Right, absolutely. Right, there was a the repentance unto life, right, which in Acts uh, uh, um, 11, uh, 18, if I'm not mistaken, or, or 28, it talks about that, the Gentiles receiving repentance unto life, you know, and, and then there's the repentance from our daily sins that we commit. Um, but moving along, right, to our next and final section, uh, we read at that last section of the paragraph, so it is every man's duty to repent of his particular known sins, particularly Right, so we understand the need for co- continuous repentance, but but why also particularity? Right, why also particular? And that, that's our our second crucial question. Why is it the believer? Why is it the believer's duty to repent uh, of their known sins, particularly? Right. Um, Jeremy Walker, pastor of Maiden Bower Baptist Church in Crawley, England, and fellow contributor to a new exposition of the London Confession, uh, London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689. Uh, which has been a great study resource to me in the preparation of this lesson. He says that repentance is, is much more than a general change of mind or a vague awareness of sin. Uh, it is relatively easy to assault sin generally, to speak with fervor against sins in the plural, but true repentance deals with particular, individual, and specific sins. 19th century theologian Charles Hodge writes, quote, No man has any right to presume that he hates sin in the general unless he practically hates sin in, uh, hates every sin in particular. And no man has the right to presume that he is sorry for and ready to renounce his sins in general, unless he is conscious of practically renouncing and grieving for each particular sin into which he falls. 
It's a pretty, pretty deep statement. Um, in so true repentance then involves dealing not merely with sin in general, right, but also with sins in particular. Walker goes on to argue that most of us um, have what we might call or refer to as constitutional sins, right? These are sins which one might be particularly prone, right? Um, and we all have different ones. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. In some, it may be envy or covetousness. In others, sexual lust, gluttony, thievery, wh whatever the case may be. Um, the list goes on and on for most of us, and, and it's likely to be several in, in most of us. Um, and the scriptures are very particular about sin. It doesn't allow for vague ambiguity as if it was some impersonal reality, right? Sin is brought to bear on the individual consciousness, right? Each of our individual consciousness, right? There are certain things for me that may be sin, right? That for you may not be. Um, and if I engage in those things, going against conscience, scripture tells me that I'm in sin. Um, and, uh, and also with regard to its particular manifestations in us, right? Before the, uh, their conversion, the Thessalonian believers had been well known for their idolatry, um, their idolatry. Their repentance was demonstrated by the turning to God from idols. The evidence of their alienation from God was idolatry, and the specific sphere of their repentance, therefore, was turning from that specific sin of idolatry. All right, First Thessalonians 1, 8 through 10, I'll read it really quick. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had amongst you how and how you turned from God, uh, to turn to God from idols to serve the living God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. All right. So just as it is, uh, as it was among the saints in Thessalonica, so too is it. It must be for us, right, from the moment that we're saved onward, uh, that we, we, we're we repenting of these sins particularly, right? And, and that God is glorified even amongst men and in, 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 in general over the fact that we have gained victory over these sins in particular, right? Um, like we're reading, we're reading the victories of the Thessalonians over, over idolatry 2,000 years later and, and God receives all the glory. Right. Uh, though truly redeemed, we engage in a battle with sin and must identify, repent of and mortify the particular sins which we are particularly prone to which we are particularly prone, naming them. Right. And seeking God's uh, grace to fight them and be rid of them, to kill them. Um, and, and, and some other examples of where we see this in the scriptures um, in Luke 19, uh, 1 to 10. This is Zacchaeus. Um, some of you may know the story. Right. He's a chief uh, tax collector in Jericho. Jesus is on his way. He confronts him, um, calls him to come down. Um, and, and, and ultimately, Zacchaeus repents of, of all the things that he did. For those of you who don't, aren't familiar with what a tax collector was, it was someone who would uh, work for Rome, often extorting money from, in very egregious ways, from, from his own people, right? He was a Jewish person working for Rome, often taking a little extra off the top for himself. And the, and the Jews hated this person, though they were like really the chief among sinners. And, and, and here we see in verse 8, uh, in verse 8 of Luke 19, and Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, the Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone, I restore it fourfold. Right? So Zacchaeus wasn't beating around the bush with regard to his sin when he repented of it. He was like, These are the things that I was doing. And, and, and if I defrauded anyone in, in, in this way, I'm making restitution. You know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it right. Right? Um, and this is a beautiful example of, right, fruit being born in keeping with repentance. Right. Uh, and this is something that we should all endeavor. If there's something in our life that the Lord is revealing to us is sin, we need to we need to, to change our minds about it. We need to turn from it. And, and if in, in the case it may manifest in doing something to remedy that or to make something right, we need to do it. Right. Uh, last portion of scripture I'll leave us with is First uh, Timothy 1, 12 through 17. I thank him, and this is from Paul, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, right? But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for the reason, um, 
for this reason, that in me as foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of, of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory forever. Amen. Right. So what we have here is a forsaking of sin uh, that is both comprehensive, uh, specific, particular and ongoing. Right. Repentance is one turning from all known sin uh, generally, but also from every known sin, particularly with, with faith in Christ for mercy from God. Um, so to answer our final question, why is it that the believers duty to repent of uh, their known sins, particularly? Well, I'd say because uh, every sin committed, right, is another occasion for which we will be praising the lamb who was a slain, right, ascribing to him worth. Right. Also, because while he was on that tree, every one of those sins, right, even the sins that we continually to commit in this life, in, in, on, on this side of salvation, right, um, he's paid for, right. In the place of justice, we receive mercy, right. In the place of wrath, we receive grace, uh, in all of which is to the praise of his glory. Uh, and so we need we need and ought not hide these things or think them little. Um, but but turn from these things, confess these things, and, and, and live in a way that is, is contrary to them um, for His glory. Um, so yeah, that that in essence, I think, is 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 what our paragraph was discussing. We we're talking about the 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 the, con the continual need for repentance in our life, and also the the need to for the particularity of our repentance. Um, and its importance. Does anyone have any questions on any of that? I know, real quick. I don't have too many questions, but I know. Easy, I'm gonna go easy. Gotcha. This, this sac, 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 what do you call it? Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus, he was the tax, tax collector. The chief tax collector. The chief collector. And when he's, why he jump on, on on the tree, on the sycamore tree, to... Well, in one, because he was short, he was a man of short yeah, stature, so he, he couldn't see over the crowd. But really, and ultimately, because God was drawing him, the Father was drawing him to Christ. He wanted to see who this man was. Ah, okay. He was being drawn to Christ. Okay. And, and he was granted repentance unto life. Ah, okay. Um, okay. Yes. So and, and we and we saw that we saw right there the fruit of that repentance, yeah. right? And that he was willing to make right all of the wrongs that he had done. Yeah, because um, he said, "When you give it to the poor, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah." That's very interesting. I never, I never, I never read that in the Bible, but mm -hmm. I don't know all the Bible anyway. But this this particular uh, uh, Luke nineteen one ten. I gotta read it again because it's very interesting. Amen. And we're always learning. This is it's a, it's a treasury, a storehouse of wisdom and knowledge, uh, and, and and just great joy. So, but Amen. I'll, I'll pray us out so we can head into the service. Uh, Father, Lord, we thank you, O God, that you grant sinners, O Lord, repentance unto life, O Lord. We thank you that even for your people, O Lord, uh, in your covenant of grace, O Lord, and by your great love, you 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 provide a means by which we can have our relationship renewed and restored when we do sin, oh, Father God. Lord, may not sin be our practice, oh, Father God. Lord, this day, this, this point in our lives, if there, if there are any sins that we are holding on to, any, any, any dear sweetheart sins, oh, Father God, things that, that, we, that we may not even think are sin, Lord, reveal them to us, oh, Father God, and, and help us to repent from them. Help us to turn to you, to see you as the, the greatest treasure, oh, Lord, our prize, oh, Lord, our glory. Um, and, and to turn from them, O Lord. We want to be holy like you are holy, O Father. We thank you that you love us so. We thank you that you sent your son to die for us, O Father God. Lord, Lord, prepare our hearts now, Lord, as we're about to go into um, continue our worship, O Father God, through uh, singing of hymns, through the hearing of your word read and the hearing of your word preached, O Father God. Lord, may we, may we glean and, and hold on to much of what we hear, O Father God, and Lord, may we apply it Oh, Father God, help us to apply it in our lives, oh, Father God, um, and, and to grow, oh, Father God. We thank you so much in this. We lift up to you in your son's precious name. Amen. Mm -hmm.